Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to James chapter 4. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, we've been walking through the, the book of Acts, but I have decided three Sundays in the spring and three Sundays in the fall, we'll take a break from our weekly study and focus on a different spiritual discipline. Uh, the first one that we focused on, which was last month, was the discipline of getting into God's Word, getting the most out of your time in God's Word. That is the most foundational of all spiritual disciplines because it feeds all the rest. Your time in the Word influences your behavior, your thoughts, everything that you do uh, second to that. Uh, so spiritual discipline of spending time in God's Word followed by the second one today of submitting to God both internally and externally. What we're going to look at is an internal heart surrender or heart submission to God will prove itself in our relationship with other people. Uh, so I hope you got a copy of the notes. If you didn't, there's some in the front. There's also some in the foyer uh, that you can pick up a paper copy or you can pull it up on our website through the QR code or through the Bible app. We want you to have that available to you. I had you turn to James chapter 4 as a great passage on submitting to God, but before we read that, I want to cover a couple of recaps that Christopher focused on at the beginning of his sermon last month on studying God's Word, getting into Scripture so that it gets into you and begins to flow out of you uh, because we're called to let our light shine. Uh, but what I want to remind you of are some similar things that he reminded us of is that each spiritual discipline that we talk about each habit that we form, each exercise of using God's grace to live out the Christian faith are not an end in themselves, okay? They are a means to an end, and that end is to be more like Jesus or to glorify God more. How many of you want God to be glorified with your life? How many of you want him to be more glorified today than he was yesterday, Right? That's, a, that's like a consuming goal that we have. And, and trying to be more like Jesus in order to glorify God, we, we focus on the things that he tells us to do and we discipline ourselves to reach that goal. That's what these are. They are practices. They're disciplines that we exercise in order to glorify God and to be more like Jesus. It says in 1 Peter 4, 7, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. The second thing we need to be reminded of is that it is an exercise of grace. So we don't, we don't conjure up in ourselves the ability to carry out these disciplines. No, we use the grace and the energy and the power that's given to us through the Holy Spirit. And then we exercise that grace in being more like Jesus. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And then the last thing I want to remind you of is the fact that they are disciplines and not simply characteristics. It requires effort on our part. All right, these are commands that require you to respond. I was doing a study this past week in Exodus on the covenant that God made with Israel. And he tells them, I will be your God. You will be my people. I will keep this covenant. And guess what your, uh, your part in that is? Obedience, right? We, we uphold our end of the relationship through obeying his commands. That's all he asked from his people. I will, I will keep the covenant. I will maintain the relationship. You follow my commands. And so these are commands to be obeyed. These are disciplines to be exercised and they require effort. It says in 2 Peter 1 verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be more, even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things... You will never stumble. Requires effort on our part. Uh, a quote from Donald Whitney, who wrote a wonderful book on the spiritual disciplines, says, spiritual disciplines are the practices found in Scripture that promote growth among believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are also the scriptural path. It's the pathway where we can expect to encounter the transforming grace of God. So picture them as 
Uh, these are like road signs. They're, they keep you heading in the right direction and motivating you to achieve godliness and Christ-likeness and honoring the Lord, which we all desire as believers, that God be honored with the way that we spend our time and our talents and our resources. So what does it mean to submit to God? I want you to look at verse 6. I'm going to read this passage in reverse order. I want to read verses 6 through 10, which is the answer, and then I want to go back and read verses 1 through 5, which is the problem. All right, so look at verse 6 first. It says, but he gives more grace, and of course this grace It's more than sin. It's more than the grasp that sin has on us. It's greater than the power that the world has. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So let's first define this word submit. What does it mean to submit to God? What does it mean to submit to others? The word submit literally means to line up under. Uh, In application, it means to find your place in line, right? It's to recognize I'm not the one in charge, so what do I do? I I find my place in line and I submit myself to that place, to that role for the glory of God, uh, regardless of what it is, what relationship we're talking about. Another meaning is to subject oneself under the authority of another. So it's being willing to be under the authority of someone else. Uh, Of course, initially, that someone else is God. It's finding my place in line and subjecting myself to his authority. It was most commonly used in military terms or in the military context to talk about a soldier recognizing his ranking and finding his place in line and then serving according to that position. And so that's what James had in mind when he was talking about our relationship to God. Uh, But he also deals with the question, where does division and problems and strife and disunity come from among us? It comes from selfishness. Literally, it comes from being submitted to no one, right? Saying, I'm my own boss. I'm going to do things my own way. And you look at uh, verse 1, it says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask and you ask and, it, and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? So you can see a a life that is not surrendered is a life that wages war with everybody, right? They're fighting the wrong battles. They're placing blame on other people instead of waging war with, with sin and Satan like we'll look at in just a moment. So what is the answer to that? The answer is not just do better. The answer is not Just lay down and and let them run over you. The answer is not, uh, you shouldn't stand up for anything. No, the answer is surrender to God. The answer is internal submission that will show results on the outside. Uh, And so this passage on submission is that submission is the response. And it begins with the attitude of the heart, which is humility. It begins with humility. Look at the passage we read, verses 6 through 10. It has some bookends on it. Look at verse 6, and then look at verse 10. Verse 6 says, he gives more grace. Grace that releases you from the power of sin, that pulls you out of Satan's grip, that conquers the world. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then look at the other end of the passage. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Man's only hope in darkness is the penetrating power of God's grace. Do you believe that? 
Man's only hope in his lost, captured state, enslaved to darkness, is the grace of God. God's undeserved, unmerited favor. He gives more grace. And humility diagnoses those who have that grace. All right, so something the Lord really convicted me on this week. And I, I'm going to tell you, I, it's been... Make sure I say this carefully because every week I'm growing and I'm learning from Scripture. But it's been a little while since I've been beat up so much in trying to study a certain topic. All right, the Lord's really worked on me this week in, in really trying to grab hold of what it means to submit to God as a daily discipline. And this is something that the Holy Spirit really impressed upon my heart. And that is that humility, and I really want you to hear this, church. Humility should not distinguish a mature believer from an immature believer. Humility should distinguish a believer from an unbeliever. Think about it. Humility characterizes a heart that's been surrendered to the Lord. It's not a, a place that you arrive. It's who you are in Christ. Humility ought to characterize us. We, we let ourselves off the hook and say, well, that's just not my personality or whatnot. Well, uh, God has come to rescue you from that nature that you were born in and to give you a new nature. And that new nature is characterized by humility. Turn over one book to the right. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, I want you to see how this humility plays out because it is the beginning of submitting to God. It is the foundation One of the most famous or, or most popular definitions used for humility, uh, I hear it all the time, is not thinking less of yourself. It's not downgrading yourself. It's just simply thinking of yourself less. Why? Because you're thinking more of God, which then in turn puts you thinking more of others. And so you, you find your place in line further down the line when you exercise humility. It says 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 5, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders, but not to single out just younger people. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, I'm going to keep reading. I want you to see how this humility and submission uh, gives birth to so many other things in our lives. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom you may he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. We see clearly in Scripture that humility is the result of finding our place in line. And it's under God's authority, right? We submit to him in our humility. It's the beginning of the discipline of submission, and humility comes from truly knowing God. Uh, you know, honestly, humility is when you reach the end of yourself. You know what I mean by that? It's, it's when you've gotten to the end of what you feel like you are uh, capable of and what you can do, and you say, no, I'm about what God can do. Humility is, is when self ends and surrender to God begins. You give him all the credit, uh, and it starts to show in our relationships. Alistair Begg said, they, they that know God cannot help but be humble, and they that really know themselves cannot be proud. You know, when we come face to face with who the, the holy God is, the God of the Bible, we see how sinful we are, confess those sins, repent of those sins, lean in on him and trust in him and totally surrender to him. So submission to God is the outworking of a truly humble heart, and there is an internal aspect. We want to get them in the right order. You'll see why that's important in a moment. There's an internal aspect of submitting to God, which then bears the fruit of an external or an outer aspect 
of submitting to God. So let's deal with the inner one first. Uh, what does it look like? I stated earlier that it's an effort. All right, it requires effort on your part. You wake up that day and you make a decision. I am gonna live with an internal affection toward my Savior and I'm gonna seek to honor him and glorify him in my behavior, in my actions, in my quiet time, right? You start the day with him, that's exercising this discipline. Is I'm gonna start the day with him so that I can spend the day with him? I want people to see him in me. These are all conscious decisions we make every morning uh, of whether we are gonna exalt the name of Christ or exalt our own name, whether we're gonna find our place in line or create a place in line, which is generally further up in the line than we have been called to do, maybe even out in front of him at times. Uh, and, and that does not bring him honor and glory. We are by nature those who oppose authority. I think I'm in like company at least half of you, right? Because I know half of you, uh, it, uh, more than maybe some of the rest. But am I in like company to say that uh, there's just a part of our character that doesn't like to be told what to do? Anybody else like that in here? I'm like that. Let me tell you how bad it is with me. I didn't even desire to do it until you told me I, I couldn't. Right, that, that became my motivation. So it's, it's thick with this one, all right? So uh, we have to surrender that, right? We have to turn that over to the Lord and say, Lord, I know naturally I don't like being told what to, be, to do. I like being the one in authority. That's why this is a discipline and not a natural quality, right? It's not a natural discipline, it's a spiritual discipline. And we have to fight against those tendencies and surrender that to the Lord. Submission to God is actively and daily surrendering to the Lordship of Christ. It is reminding, this, this would help us, all right? Every morning when you get up, try this, I, I have to do this. Brian, you are not in charge. Think about it. Uh, what does it mean to believe in the authority of God's word? It means that you believe that book has the right to tell you what to do. It holds ultimate authority in your life. So what does it mean to submit to God? It means to submit to his word. You read it, you find out what's expected of you, and you obey it. So it's, it's action, it's effort. You surrender and submit by responding appropriately, lining up under. I am not the one in control. God is, and he has called me to play a certain role, and I submit myself to that role daily. It must take place in the heart. Uh, look at verse 8 of John chapter 4. It says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. This, this phrase, draw near, means to pursue intimacy. It means to have an intimate relationship with your heavenly Father. Draw near in heart. Surrender your heart, the center of your being, to him. Submission has to be an internal act before it can consistently be an external act. Uh, it doesn't happen naturally, and often we get this verse backwards. All right, let me show you how we do that. Uh, James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. But how many times do we say, God, if you'll draw near to me, then I will draw near to you and we make bargains with God. And we say, God, if you will make this happen or if you will show yourself in this way or if you will give me this warm affection, can I share something with you from the bottom of my heart? God has already drawn near to you in saving you. He has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. And now it is your daily responsibility to draw near to him. Stop making deals with God. He's already fulfilled his part. All right? Uh, so we submit to him by drawing close. The reason why it's so important not to get that switched around is because some of the most important times in your life where submission is necessary is during the times of total chaos, 
When you don't feel like things are under control, when you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, when you feel like uh, anything but that warm, loving affection, what do you do during that time? You submit to God. You say, God, I need you. God, I want to be intimate with you. God, I need to spend time with you. God, if you don't move in this moment, uh, everything is going to come crumbling down. So I'm going to find my place in line, and I'm going to do my part for the glory of God. You exercise that discipline. Paul said in the, in the armor of God passage of Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And I would add to that, even when you don't feel like it or God hasn't checked all the boxes for you today for you to follow up on your end of the bargain. No, he, he commands, draw near to me and you will experience my nearness. I will draw near to you. Active submission to God involves consistent resistance to the devil. Look at verse 7 of James 4. It says, uh, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit to God, resist the devil. Uh, resisting the devil involves humility, just like submitting to God involves humility. Why? You recognize it is God's grace and God's strength that allows you to resist, but you cannot genuinely submit to God if you are still submitting to the desires of Satan, right? He has given more grace. He has freed you from Satan's grasp. So what do you do? You submit and resist. Those are opposites. Submit and resist resist. Uh, That's why submission must come first. We'll we'll see how that resisting plays itself out in uh, public evidence as we look at the second part of verse 8. So what does internal submission create? What evidence does internal submission produce? And here's another question. What should your relationships look like? All the horizontal ones. What should they look like if you are submitting to God? And that's what I want to deal with now, just in practical application. Look at verse 8, the second part. It says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. This term, cleanse your hands, came from what the priests were required to do when they approached God in worship. They were supposed to thoroughly wash their hands before going in to perform the sacrifices. How does that apply to us? I need to confess my sins. I need to make sure I have clean hands, not hands that are actively serving Satan, actively committing sin when these hands bring worship to God. But it doesn't just need to be the hands that are cleansed. How about the heart? It says purify your heart, which is your motives, your thoughts, your reason for why you're doing what you're doing. The psalmist says in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. And so there's this act of repentance and resistance that goes along with submission. How does that play itself out in our relationships? We begin to deal with our own sin as the first part of James 4 talked about, the things that we have done that causes dissension in those relationships. Selfishness, seeking our own uh, desires, uh, defensiveness, placing blame, all of these things rise up in us when we are not surrendered to God. Uh, We often get the cart before the horse, even with humility. Uh, I want to share a personal testimony with this because I I tried it both ways. And I'll tell you which one worked the best. It was the way that the scripture told me to do it. That that might be a surprise to some of you. It was was a surprise to me. It stuck in my uh, sin of what I was doing. So here's how we get the cart before the horse. We think that we can cause certain outcomes by exercising humility. But let me tell you what, the exercise of humility without the internal submission to God will be inconsistent at best. 
All right, it might be goal-oriented. Maybe you're trying to manipulate the situation to reach a certain outcome, or you know enough about the other person that you respond a certain way to prevent something that you think will happen. But once that's over, so is the quality of humility. Uh, the inconsistency will really surface when you have to react to something and you haven't had time to think through it and gather yourself and respond accordingly. And you just react, and you're like, wow, why was that so prideful? So here's how, here's how I got it backwards. Uh, God really started penetrating my heart and focusing in on a particular sin that I had. And I'm, I'm just going to guess that about five years ago was really when the, the battle really got turned up of rooting this sin out of my heart. And it was the sin of defensiveness. Whenever someone would criticize me or challenge me or rebuke me, my initial reaction was defensiveness. Oh, yeah, well, you, right, you have that rise up in us. Uh, but remember, he who knows God cannot help but be humble, and he who knows himself can't be proud. So we, it comes from that uh, getting out of our place in line and, and having a tight grip on things that don't belong to us instead of surrendering them to the Lord. And so I kept wondering, why am I constantly being defeated in this battle of trying to respond with humility instead of responding with defensiveness? And it was because I was only paying attention to the external symptoms. And I, the Holy Spirit led me in the direction of, you have some areas of your life that you haven't surrendered to me. And it surfaces when people try to step on those areas. Or you get uh, tempted with losing your grip on those areas. What do you do? You defend. You fight the wrong battles. You surrender that to the Lord and you start fighting for instead of against. You start fighting for your marriage instead of against your marriage. You start fighting for your children instead of against your children. You start fighting for your occupation instead of with your employment. You start serving, right? Because you're free to do that. Why? It belongs to the Lord. You've surrendered it to him. I, I finally, I'm, I'm excited to share this, that uh, just this past week, after turning this over to the Lord and saying, Lord, I, this defensive attitude is coming from my heart. Why is it in there? And, and really working through surrendering it to the Lord. This past week, I had somebody come up and rebuke me for a certain sin that I had committed. The person that rebuked me for that sin is committing the same sin. So imagine the challenge that that produced for my flesh. I wanted to knock that speck out of their eye with the plank that was hanging out of mine. Okay, that, that was the initial thought. Then I said, uh, you know, in, in quietness, in surrender, I said, that's not the right thought. I sat there for a minute, and I said, you know what? You're right. I shouldn't have done that. And then this one, you, you feel that lump that starts to rise right here, and you swallow it again. You say, and thank you for pointing it out. I'm better for it. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to repent of it, and I appreciate you taking the time. That wasn't the opportunity for me to say, you're one to be talking, right? That's not a surrendered attitude. A surrendered attitude is one of humility. Because they were right. I, I had committed a sin that needed to be pointed out. And I'm better for having it pointed out. I would not have responded that way several years back. Uh, not as far down the journey of submission as I am now. So what kind of effects does this heart submission have in our interactions with other people? And that's just one of many. Why is that pride in there? It shouldn't be in there. It should be surrendered to the Lord. Why? Did, that, it's not their fault. They're just providing me an opportunity to diagnose something that shouldn't be true, right? And so you surrender it to the Lord. Grow from those opportunities, and if you get the cart before the horse thinking that the external act is the answer, 
then guess what you have to do to get better at that? You have to go around and find people to rebuke you and criticize you. That doesn't make sense, does it? Instead, if you'll spend your time surrendering to the Lord, when those opportunities arise, guess what's going to come out? A heart surrendered to the Lord. A consistency. There's a big difference between an external posture of conformity and a true internal submission to God that produces results. Uh, I'll tell you just a simple illustration to prove what I'm saying. A parent driving down the road has a kid in the back seat that's supposed to be buckled and they look in the rearview mirror and they notice that the kid is not only unbuckled but is standing up in the seat while the car is in motion. All right, that's freak out time for me. You could die if something, you know, like, so what do you do? You get in your seat right now and you put that seat belt on. Your life depends on it. It is so dangerous. It's against the law. Do you want your dad to go to jail? You know, you're giving all these commands. And so the kid sits down with this grumpy look on their face and they, they buckle the seat belt. And they, their look on their face screams this, which our, our look and demeanor screams a lot of times. I might be sitting on the outside but I'm standing on the inside, right? We, don't we act that way sometimes? And so this, this posture of conforming on the outside is gonna tell on us. So submission, here's an easy way to look at it. Submission is the honor part of obedience, right? It's doing what you're told, when you're told, but doing it with a happy heart, doing it with a, a joy in your heart for the one that you're doing it for. So submission brings out the honor part of obedience. So what does that look like in various relationships and how do we diagnose when there is a submission issue? Submitting to the Lord, then submitting to others. Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another in the fear of God. And then after that passage, Paul says, okay, what does that look like in a marriage? What does that look like in parenthood? What does that look like in uh your occupation with servant-master relationship. How do you submit to one another in the fear of the Lord? And notice all the commands in Scripture to subject yourself to someone else are always followed by as unto the Lord. That's why you need to get that part of the equation right so that you can live it out in your relationship with others. So what would that mean if a, if a child will not clean their room at their parents' continual request. What can we say of that child? They are not actively surrendering to the Lord, right? Because it would play out in their submission or finding their place in line and and carrying out that role for the glory of God. And, And don't hear this with legalistic ears. If you do that, then when we get to the one that applies to you, you're gonna shut me off, okay? Listen to this as a way of life. Like if this describes you, let it be a diagnosis that, hey, I need to surrender some things, right? Because there's some evidence that I'm not doing that. So let, let's keep going. Uh, if uh, It says in Ephesians 6, 1, children obey your parents. How? In the Lord. Express your submission to the Lord through your submission to your parents for this is right. If a wife consistently rebels against the godly leadership of a Christian husband, what can be said of the active participation of that wife's heart? Ephesians 5.22, wives submit to your own husbands. How? As unto the Lord. How about if a husband is a tyrant and does not practice sacrificial servant leadership, expressing selfless care for those in his family. What can be said of that husband? His heart is not actively disciplined and surrendered to the Lord. It says in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Or how about this one? If a citizen does not submit to the civil jurisdiction obeying the law of the land, 
Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. How about a, a church member that constantly rebels against the Christ-centered leadership of its pastors? Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Or this next statement can really be read in, on both ends of the uh, relationship. How about an employee not fulfilling the expectations of the employer? How about an employer that is lording his position un, uh, unruly, you know, and over his employees? What can be said of those hearts not actively surrendered to the Lord. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart. How? As to Christ. Right? So our our surrender and submission to God gives evidence in all of our earthly relationships. Why? Because it helps us find our place in line and perform our role to his glory in obedience. And we find joy in doing that if it's our heart's desire. Very difficult to do, but we must not get the cart before the horse. It's easier to say that we submit to God when we're sitting in the quietness of our own home, but how do we produce evidence of that surrender and that submission when we're interacting with other people? Uh, would, would the people that you have relationships with, family relationships, friendships, work relationships, would they describe you as humble? Would they des describe you as servant-minded? Would they describe you as selfless? Right? These are the character qualities of a surrendered heart. It affects every relationship we have. Are your relationships char characterized by humility and a willingness to serve your place in line? It's not about superiority. It's not about being in charge. It's about glorifying God in total surrender. So really what we have to deal with is that repetitive tendency of I don't like to be told what to do or I like to be. In. we got to constantly suppress that. How do you suppress it? You surrender it to the Lord. Lord, I am not in charge. You are in charge. You've placed callings upon my life to do this in this relationship, to do this in this. And since I'm surrendered to you, I'm going to obey that calling for your glory. So we look for ways to exalt the name of our Lord through our humble interactions with others. Can, can my interaction with others tell that I am not my own Lord and that I surrender to Jesus as Lord? Look at Matthew chapter 20. We'll close verses 26 through 28. Following Christ's example. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be the first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Is your life submitted to God? And how is it producing evidence in all of your interactions with others? I want to share a quote. I've seen it surface multiple times, but certainly fits in appropriateness here. Is that it's very hard for a dead man to get offended. And so, what is a necessary step in submission? It's dying to self, right? It's, it's putting yourself behind, and, and what does the Scripture say? Putting the needs of others in front of your own, making much of them, right? Thinking of yourself less, thinking of them more, is an overflow of surrendering and dying to self and, and giving all to the Lord. Does that describe you? And what you might say, you might say what I say. 
Here's a humble answer. Not always. Well, how about take those times when it surfaces and let those be sanctifying moments to say, ah, I just determined today there's another area of my life that needs a little more submission involved. And then grow from it, learn from it. That'll, that will become your response when someone else helps you diagnose that. That, hey, you got an area in your life where you need a little more submission. And you say, you know what? You're right. Thank you for helping me see that. Because I want to be more like Jesus. That's what these spiritual disciplines do. Submitting to God makes us more like Jesus. Let's bow our heads together. The, the song that Pastor Leon's going to lead us in, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, and you just keep your eyes closed. I want you to be in a state of prayer. It is a very difficult song to sing. It's the hymn, I Surrender All. Many times in the past, I've, I've sang it with my lips, and in my heart, I'm rattling off things that I haven't surrendered yet. And so what I want you to do at least for the first part of this song, instead of singing the lyrics, the lyrics are gonna be sung as a prayer. And you sit there in submission to what the Holy Spirit's doing and just say, Lord, I, I want that to be true. Maybe you can sing that song and praise God for it. But we want that to be true. I surrender all, all to Jesus. So we want that to be true. And here, here's what we're going to do. I'm, I've got other ministers ready to stand across the front. If at any point in you doing dealings with the Holy Spirit this morning, you come across something and you say, there's a part of my life not surrendered. There's a relationship that really needs to be influenced by submission to God. And you want somebody to pray with you about it? We're going to be standing down here during this song to pray specifically with you. Or maybe you want to say, I don't have a heart surrendered to God. I've never surrendered to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. We definitely want to talk to you about that. That's where it starts. But just as this song is sung, comb, comb through your life, comb through each one of your relationships, look for signs of submission or the lack thereof, and just spend this time to surrender that to the Lord.